thanks to a recent obsession with Follow That Bird, I'm covering the one and only Big Bird today. Warning, I know this probably looks like a kid's video, but it is not. This video will contain topics too heavy for children. Hello friends and family members, I'm Megan, and this is The Fangirl, a web series that has been ruining childhood memories since 2016. I have three kids, so I've seen a lot of movies that are aimed at younger audiences, and while exposing my tiniest tot archer to follow that bird, which is one of my favorites from when I was growing up, I realized that Big Bird actually has a really tragic life. Well, tragic in a relative sense, Big Bird seems happy enough, so it's not like he has this terrible life on a day-to-day -day level, but it is a really, really messed up one. Now I'm sure every person in the world is familiar with Sesame Street and Big Bird, but if you've never seen the Sesame Street movie, Follow That Bird, it's actually pretty good. It's really held up over the years. It's not really preschool centric, so it's a lot more like a Muppet movie. And the premise is that this organization of birds called the Feathered Friends come in and get Big Bird adopted by this family of dodo birds in Ocean View, Illinois. But but it turns out that Big Bird doesn't really like his new family life, so he heads back to his chosen family of Sesame Street. It's a really sweet movie where the overall moral is that your family can be anyone, even if they're not blood related or the same kind of being that you are. Now, as a movie, it holds up against time really well, but as a deeper look into Big Bird's life, it's like WT. F. Sesame Street as a series does go into Big Bird's home a lot, but you never really pay much attention to it. It's a preschool show, so everything's kind of bright and colorful and there's a lot going on to distract you. However, in Follow That Bird, it becomes very apparent that Big Bird lives in an abandoned lot between two houses that has no roof, no locking door, and a bunch of inappropriate junk. And I don't mean, oh, stuff he doesn't need. I mean, flat out garbage. I mean, seriously, it's like Big Bird lives in trash and all of his belongings and himself are out there open to the elements. So yeah, concernable, but no big deal, right? I mean, Big Bird's huge. He's got to be what, like 20, 30, 70 by now? He's perfectly capable of choosing where he lives. Wait, Big Bird is only six years old? What? I always thought he seemed a little bit simplistic, but I thought that was for the benefit of the preschoolers watching, not that he was actually a child. I never realized that Big Bird was kindergarten age until I saw the movie, which is so sad. Why is this baby living all alone? The movie also shows us a little bit of the case file on Big Bird, and I'll put it up here, but it's kind of blurry because I only have it on SD. It says that the county court has released a consent for Big Bird to be adopted, and they did this because he lives alone with no parents, sisters, or brothers, and he has no bird friends. So this idea that Big Bird needs to be adopted is completely valid. I kind of feel like the movie wants us to look at it like, oh, well, that's like, saying that a black family couldn't raise a white child or something like that, but it's really more like if a six-year-old were being raised by dogs. They're not the same thing as him. They're not going to teach him the stuff he needs to know to be an effective person. And the dogs might be good to him and keep him fed and keep him safe to a large degree, but it's just not the same as being raised with your own people or at least your own species. The document even says what I just noticed in the movie. Big Bird has no furniture, just junk collected from the garbage, and he lives in an abandoned lot. Again, concernable. For those of you who are new here, I used to be a foster parent, so there's going to be no change in my mind that the feathered friends didn't do the thing that was best for Big Bird in trying to get him adopted. They're intervening to make his life better, not worse. And I know this is a fictional movie based on a fictional TV series, but this whole situation just really turns my stomach. Big Bird has been living on Sesame Street for ages, and not one person has tried to take him in or help him. Yes, yes, they're all friends and that's wonderful to a point, but if this is a six-year-old child, he needs more than some kindly folks to interact with when they feel like it. He needs people who will keep him safe and help to raise him. And even though all the residents of Sesame Street get together and they tell Miss Finch of the Feathered Friends that they're Big Bird's real family, they treat him more like a pet than a being with human level intelligence. Really, not even a pet. The dog gets to come inside at night. Big Bird is more like a stray cat that everyone wants 
wants to pet and feed, but nobody wants to take him to get vaccinated. But I'm also curious, how did Big Bird get to this point? If the show and the movie are canon with each other, which is extremely debatable, then Big Bird has at least one cousin in Latin America and a grandmother who pops up from time to time. So Big has family, which makes it even more perplexing why he lives alone in an alley. So here's what I think happened. Big Bird was born, and since Follow That Bird suggests his first name is Big, that probably means he's well above the average size for his species. And that has to be some kind of genetic trait that runs in his family because Granny Bird and his cousin, I'm gonna say this horribly, Abelardo, are both seven feet tall as well. But if Big's parents were large birds too, I imagine he wouldn't be called Big Bird, it'd be more like George or Yellow, I don't know, something that sounds less like a cowboy nickname. Hey there, Slim, how you doing, hop along? What's up, Big? Then based on the court papers, Big Bird's parents died. And it was probably a really sudden death because they didn't have any plan in place for someone to raise their son. Big Bird did have some extended family, but getting across the border as a kid who is all alone is not something that can be done. So Big Bird wouldn't be able to just walk to his Latino family, and he probably wouldn't know anything about their address to write them for help. And even if Big Bird's Latin family knew what had happened to him, it would be such a huge, albeit fictitious, battle to get an orphan into your custody internationally. So the Latin American part of Big Bird's family is out. Then there's Granny Bird, who seems to genuinely love Big Bird, and she at least sounds American and certainly knows where Big Bird lives because she goes to his house, or hole in the alley, or nest, really, in an abandoned lot. Granny, why don't you just take Big Bird in then? Well, this is actually a big issue in a lot of human custody cases. Grandparents are a great option for a lot of children, but there's also many grandparents who are in nursing homes or they're just too old or destitute. They physically or mentally or financially just can't take care of a kid, and where a third party adopting might get some stipends or expenses covered, there are a lot of court systems that won't offer that same thing if a blood relative takes on the child. So I assume that Granny Bird's issues are financial or physical that she can't keep up with Big Bird. So that means Big Bird was left all alone in the world with nowhere else to go. He was probably wandering around by himself and then and he got scared and found this little nook that made him feel safe. It was walled up on three sides, so better than nothing, better than being out in the open. So Big Bird just planted himself in that empty space, day by day, bit by bit. Big Bird built a nest, he took in trash for his treasures, and he kept a good attitude because people were a lot nicer to him when he did. I mean, Big Bird's doing fantastic for himself, all things considered, but he really does deserve more than what he's getting. It's almost tragic that Sesame Street has introduced new characters to deal with foster care, but they still haven't found a more solid home for Big Bird to live in. And I know it's kind of iconic that he lives out in this open space with his nest and his teddy bear and he does what he wants, but considering that he's six years old, I mean, that's just not okay. Can we do something nicer for Big Bird? At least give him a roof, some type of caretaker to check in on him, something to show he's not just a little kid all by himself and abandoned. Oh, he's just in shambles and torn down and doesn't know what to do, like the lot he lives in. I know that sounds like a stretch, but sincerely, Sesame Street has now had 50 years to do something, build a house for Big Bird something, and no one is helping this child except for the feathered friends who got shooed away by people who didn't really want to take accountability for Big Bird. So now, for the million dollar question, is Big Bird this sweet, positive person because that's who he naturally is? Or is he masking a lot of pain with a smile? Yeah, 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 it's a children's program, I know. But everything from the show and the series are deliberately designed from scratch, which means Big Bird's lifestyle is completely within their control. They have chosen for 50 years to represent his life that way, and I think that's pretty depressing. Sorry for ruining Big Bird's happy for everybody. I might be overthinking it, but that's literally my job. Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram 
as my own personal self. And I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey McGann, I wanna mail you something. How do I do that? Easy, just click the about tab on my channel page and my most current PO Box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.